funny how many of us. Right? I saw. I started as a receptionist at a fabric company. Right, seventeen. What do we do? Right. Um, but you've been using this particular vehicle, Land Trust, for since 1982. Since 1982. So Ward is going to talk about his favorite vehicle for sheltering investments, and he's going to talk to you about why it's useful. He's going to talk to you about how you can implement it, and he's got quite an extensive handout here that you guys can see. So why don't we just go ahead and give a hand for Ward Hannigan. been training people. I was forced into speaking, public speaking, with Jack Fullerton. Kept telling him no. I never took a class in speaking, and, uh, and I didn't see any need for me going up there to his place in Irvine and bailing him out. But he begged and begged. Said, okay. <laughs> Went up there and found out I loved doing it. Okay. And uh, so now I wanted to talk any place I could. So as a side. Um, and I was asked, I gave a talk on foreclosure. My specialty was uh, for, geez, how many years? 30 years? Something like that. Buying and selling uh, properties at trustee sales at the courthouse steps. And I probably bought probably between five and 600 properties and flipped them. So foreclosure flippers. And that was my major gig, um, even though uh, 10 years before I got started in that, I, uh, was in the apartment broker's business. I was an agent working for investors buying and selling apartment houses. I was very good at that, and I'd probably still be doing it if uh, interest rates didn't spike like crazy in 1982, and it went up to 16, 18%. How many people here would be real excited about buying an apartment house at 18%? <laughs> Nobody. So everybody was sitting on their hands, and I was starving to death because, you know, I don't make anything unless someone buys one or sells one. And uh, so when I was convinced after about six months that it was going to persist for a while, I decided I'd like to get into this thing called foreclosures. Now the way I got into foreclosures is kind of interesting because I made a lot of money, and you guys can take a cue from this, I made a lot of money in buying and selling apartment houses because I was able to convince the seller to allow us to take title to the property subject to, okay? So who in this room doesn't even understand what I'm talking about when I say subject to? It's gotta be some people. Okay, so subject to means that you're going to buy the property and the seller is not gonna require that you pay off his existing loan. He's gonna allow you to take title subject to that loan remaining, okay? And so that's what I did. I convinced the sellers to do that because you can get a little more sales price, all right? And now I had buyers that I could easily find more easily because they didn't have to qualify with an institutional lender, okay? So if they had some blemishes on their credit or something like that, who cared? Doesn't matter, okay? The security was in the amount of down payment you put. So we do subject to deals. And so then um, the, the equity between what was owed on that first and the sales price, um, you know, how do we take care of that? Well, the guy, I'll, I'll use a simple example. Let's say it was a $100,000 deal, all right? The $60,000 existing first on it already. So how much equity do we have? 40,000. 40, 40, okay, so my buyer's got 20, all right? So how do we take care of the remaining 20? Uh, yeah. So the seller carries a second, all right, for that unpaid 20. So I did that quite a bit. And I like to do what was called wraparound, an all-inclusive or wraparound deed of trust. And I even taught classes in that because I found out that if nobody else knew about it, I couldn't put a deal together. So I had to start teaching guys. Well, guys wouldn't take the class from me. My competitors in San Diego, because I'm a competitor, they don't want to admit that you know this little short guy didn't teach them anything. So I taught my real property uh, a teacher in law school Okay, what uh, an all-inclusive was, and uh, a wraparound. Then I contacted my title company, Fidelity, and they contributed a meeting room. So, so this was being put on by Fidelity, right? 
No, we weren't handing it. And having the attorney talk. And I was, my presence in the room was explained as, well, um, you know, Ward uses this all the time. Uh, that was Larry Baldoff, the attorney. And he says, every once in a while, you know, there's a special wrinkle. And if it is, then I'll have Ward explain that. You know? So anytime you, somebody asked him a question, he couldn't, he couldn't explain it. He said, oh, Ward just did that. Ward, why don't you come out and tell him? <laughs> and so Larry and I split the cost of the class, okay? And as he's splitting with an attorney, you're not supposed to be doing that. I didn't know that was against the law. But anyways. <laughs> I guess so what happens is nothing's perfect. How many people think that per your life's been perfect up to this point? <laughs> so nothing's perfect. And so not all the time are these loans paying off the way I promised the, the seller. You know, so that is, guy's going to be paying this every month, and you're going to get the spread, you know, the we're going to take the master payment, whatever that is, we're going to subtract the payment out of the first, and then you're going to get uh, the, uh, the balance in a, uh, for your second. And uh, oftentimes, they so people sold apartment houses rather quickly because uh, if it went way up in value, gee, they wanted to get, but now they want to trade in that fourplex for a sixplex or an eightplex. I like them trading it in because I get a commission when they trade it in. And I get a commission when they buy something bigger, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, but every once in a while, uh, maybe it's uh, three more owners on, uh, the guy's not paying his his mortgage payment, okay. And uh, so I would have sellers calling me up. Is this Ward Hanning? And yes. Well, God damn it! You know, you talked me into <laughs> taking back a piece of paper, and I am not getting any any any. Uh, Money on this thing is paper is worthless. Use it for new toilet papers and rah, 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 you know. And uh, so, what can I do? And I said, Well, you can foreclose. Yeah, what's that mean? <laughs> and so you can see that I had to, to answer these kinds of questions when they came up. They expected me to understand how do you uh, cure a delinquent uh, a loan that you know they they were depending on. So. Uh, since I was going to law school in the evening at that time, and I just went down to the law library at school and started reading everything I could about foreclosures. And I was really motivated, right? Because I had to answer these guys whenever they called up. And the more I got farting around with that kind of stuff, the more I had a, um, you know, uh, the more glib I got for it, and the more, less intimidated, and less fearful I was if somebody called up. And so that's how I got, and I wanted to do it. I'm making a ton of money in buying and selling apartment house, but I'm bored out of my gourd. Absolutely, oh, you know. And uh, so I didn't have the guts to quit because I liked that monthly, those commission checks coming in, and I had, you know, tweaked myself way up here with all the kinds of, you know, bills I had to pay. I used to fart when you a lot of uh, silly cars, you know, uh, Bentley at first and Rolls Royce and Mercedes and Corvettes. I had the, the car bug. Don't ever get it. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's worse than pneumonia. <laughs> and uh, so I finally got rid of that. But uh, anyhow, I, uh, so I was afraid, and this maybe is pertinent to you, if you got a great job, it's not a blessing. It's a curse. I'm convinced it's a curse because it inhibits you from taking a chance. Okay, I don't know how many people, uh, you know, are afraid they got a, a great job over here and there's something they kind of like don't like, they wish they could do something else, but they make a lot of money at it and they can't take a risk over here, right? Because they're, they've got their bills up to this. They can't take a, let's say, three months without getting a paycheck, or six months, or something like that. And so, <clears throat> never make the switch. Never made it. I don't think I would have the guts to do that either, okay? But when all of a sudden the rug was pulled out from under me by, I can't sell these overpriced apartments to people because the interest rates are so high, you know, then I was pushed into having to find something. And so it was easier, much easier for me to do that, all right? Uh, and so I sort of like the fact that, you know, <laughs> what I thought was the worst thing that ever happened to me, you know, turned out to be the best one because, you know, yeah, I was making good money buying and selling apartment houses, but nothing, nothing compared to the 
money I made in foreclosures. Okay, nothing. So why don't I do foreclosures now? Anybody know? There's nothing there. Okay, so that cratered. So what you gotta be is basically look for those changes, all right? And at first they seem terrible, okay? You, you lost your job or you got divorced or something happened, you know? And in, in the beginning, you're just really uptight about it. And uh, so I was uptight that I couldn't sell any more apartment houses because my living standard was now way up here. And I made money so easy that I saved any. You know, smarty pants doesn't have to save money. You know? And so, whoa, you know, now uh, I got to go out and do something. So now I, I said, all of a sudden, I tried for closures in 76, and I was so busy, I wanted to do a sideline. Did you ever want to do a sideline? You know, you got your main job, and you're going to dabble over here on the side. And you, it, it never worked for me, it never works out because you don't commit, it and commit to it enough. You're doing it you know, with the time you might have left over from your main job, you know. So, uh, and so foreclosures didn't work for me in 76, and I forgot all about that two years later and tried it all over again in 78. Still didn't work for me part-time. And then in 84, you no, know, not 84, 82, four years later, uh, yeah, it worked like gangbusters. Absolutely like gangbusters. So, anyhow, that's a little bit about my life. I was a, I did get in the stock brokerage business. I found out I had a town for selling, you know? And uh, so I, I had a, a, an economics degree from uh, uh, UCR, and so I was attracted to, um, when I quit IBM, I was attracted to, to come and try and become a stock broker. If you know anybody that's been a stock broker, uh, you don't, when, when you finally are trained and you come, you you now go on the floor, you, uh, they just pay you pure commission. You don't get a salary. So you don't eat that month if you didn't convince somebody to buy or sell something. And it depend, didn't depend on what kind of month it was. There are lots of times in the stock market where you should be doing nothing. You shouldn't be buying, you shouldn't be selling. You know, then how does Ward eat, you know? So I, um, I, the, the, company had bullshit stories, okay? <laughs> and it came out every Monday, some guy back in New York came up with a, a bullshit story for the week, you know? And so <laughs> we're gonna be selling that stock. That's out of inventory. Look at it, this, the Shearson has, a, 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 in their own, in their own uh, uh, safe, or the Ballywick, they've got tons of stock that they get because they got it out of a, an IPO or something like that. And now they give us a story about how fantastic it would be for you to own this stuff. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, if it's that fantastic, why in the hell are they giving me an extra spiff to sell it? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, you know? And so they were, that's what's called principling a trade. They were a principal in that trade rather than, you know, a go-between, okay? And so they're selling this stuff out. Well, after my excuse, have you ever used this excuse what everybody else is doing? <laughs> Good, shit, everybody else is doing it. It must be okay for me, you know. Well, if everybody was jumping off the Coronado Bridge, you know, well, I'm going to go get in line and jump off, you know. Come on, Hannigan, you got a brain, you got some ethics, maybe, you know. All this kind of stuff. And so, anyways, after a while, I did not like Ward Hannigan, okay. I was ashamed of him. I thought he was an asshole, and I just couldn't, couldn't do that. I thought because I was an atheist, I could do anything I want. I didn't, nobody was looking at me, you know, and uh, it just bugged the living bejeebers out of me. I ended up in a hospital, almost dying because I had a uh, reaction to that with thigh hives, and so uh, I didn't know if you get it really bad, it goes in your throat, chokes off your air. I found out about that one. <laughs> I ended up, you know, buck naked in a, in a mercy room in, in a hospital. And uh, so the doctor said, you better tell us my wife, you better tell him to stop whatever he's doing because uh, you won't be that lucky the next time. <laughs> After two days of crying with a cheerful wife, I finally was convinced. And 
So I gave that up. And I swore I would never, never, never again screw anybody for money. Never will. And uh, so that's why I can't teach foreclosures now. Because if you are sitting across from me and I'm teaching you the wonderful world about foreclosure, the inference, just because I'm teaching you, is I think it's okay for you to do that, right? And I know better. You don't, because you're new. But I know that you're going to be spinning your wheels. You're not going to make any money. Out of it. Oh, yeah, I made a, a fee for training. You know, but uh, is that the right thing to do? How many people here would like me to teach you when it's not really the right thing you should be doing? So I don't do it. Now, if it comes back someday where I think it's lucrative, sure, I'll do it, but not now. All right, so that's my, <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, were there hundreds and hundreds of foreclosures or at least notices of default every week? No, every day? not as many. Not if you, many, if you take the statistics that I do, because it was, it, I was critical that I knew what the tempo of the market was right now, and <clears> down in, at the SBCIA <throat> once a month, I give a report on the frequency of foreclosure. So in San Diego, I know it, and we have the NODs, which is the beginning of foreclosure. The notices of default now are averaging um, on a monthly basis what used to come out every day. Okay. So, I mean, it's been a massive, massive, massive uh, uh, shutdown as far as the uh, sales are concerned. So, uh, and then so we still have the same audience down at the courthouse steps of newbies who think that all you have to do is go down there with some money and bid. And that, so what's a big deal about foreclosure? And they take a perfectly good deal and they bid it to smithereens, okay? Because they're, you know, uh, naive and because they, they haven't studied anything because they didn't think they need to. And so, if you've got five guys doing that, you go down, even though you're bright, you're smart, you went to the best teacher in town, okay? <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, it's not gonna do you any good, okay? We may have a bunch of morons bidding against you. <laughs> all right, so what's that got to do with tonight? Yes, sir. Yeah, I know, um, I, was, I was a trustee buyer for about seven years also, huh? and, I did a lot of that. and I know one thing at the steps a lot of times, what we used to do, um, we'd see the newbie we all know each other that are down there. The pros. Yeah. And we'd see someone come and stuff like that and say, as soon as we found out what house they're bidding on, we just bid them up. We know about where the house we're going to go to. We beat them up and drop them. Yeah. And but you see, that's against the law. Yeah, it is. That's called bid but chilling. They've seen it. Yeah. You call it happens water? all the time. Hmm? They bid them up. It's called bid chilling. You can't engage in any activity that has, has a tendency to choke off the bidding. Yeah. Okay. And so, He's absolutely right. It happens in every single uh, uh, venue where there are public foreclosure auctions. Okay, or not just foreclosures. They have the same thing in the art world. They have the same thing in, in rare cars. They have it with uh, the, the goods that Custom House is, uh, has grabbed because it's just some, you know, it's got too much, uh, you know, ivory in it or whatever, you know, and they sell all that stuff at auction afterwards. And so uh, that sort of system is endemic to just the auction world. All right, so what are we doing tonight? That just gives you some background for Ward Hannigan, okay? And probably too much. <laughs> I'm probably going home and why the hell did I say that? <laughs> Do they really need to know that? I have what's called, I'm convinced, and I used to have it, I'm gonna dig it out again, is uh, that when we're born, okay, every human, whether you like it or not, secretly there's an implant, I don't know who does it yet, but there's, a, there's an implant in your brain, and that stays with you all of your life, and that's called babbler. And babbler, just the main job is to tell you that you're worthless, you're too tall, too short, too ugly, too fat, too this, that, and the other, and babber, babber, babber. And at times, you just have to really 
take control and tell Babbler to shut up. <laughs> and so I oftentimes will bet Babbler, okay, you jerk, you say that this, I'm not going to ask that girl to dance. Watch this, Babbler. <laughs> I'd ask that girl to dance. She'd look at me and say, no, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's talk about things that you really came for tonight, right? We can erase all that other stuff that we just were talking about and have more room on the tape for some really serious stuff. All right, so I know that when I started out, I had to really kind of like punk and fumble because I wanted, uh, see, I came from the world where people bought apartments usually with other people's money, especially when you're getting up in size of 12 and 14 and all that kind of stuff. And so they, the, the, um, the entity that different investors wanted to join was a limited partnership. And so one of the reasons why I was successful, partly in the apartment business, I understood that the faster we got uh, the uh, paperwork done from one side to the other, Okay, from the seller and the buyer and on and on, get it all deposited in escrow, the faster we could close it. All right, so I was very familiar with that sort of setup and I hated it because the organizer, the broker, who is usually the principal who organized all this, would have to be the, in a limited partnership, you need at least one general partner. So that would be their hat they had to wear and that means unlimited liability. And it just, you know, I just don't want to take on that unlimited liability as far as, you know, the apartment house was concerned. And now, um, or when I started out in foreclosure, because in foreclosure, I didn't have a lot of money because I used to spend it because I thought it would never end. So I had to sell my house, uh, which had about 100,000 equity. I netted around 86. My wife, very upset. Have you guys ever? understood what shunning is? <laughs> <laughs> Just do what I did, you know. And, uh, and I thought it was so cool because I had the house in trust, which my wife really didn't understand. And uh, so she said, no, we're not selling the house. She said, I put all my blood, sweat, and tears and stuff into this. I, I completely redecorated. I did the whole the yard, the landscaping, I did all this and that, you're going to have to come up with a better solution about getting money. And uh, so I said, well, I really don't need her signature because I'm the trustee of the trust. <laughs> <laughs> you see what a rat pink I was? <laughs> so I sold the house. Oh, <laughs> so I was shunned by everybody now. <laughs> my, my kids, the boys, they would, you walk down a hallway and you say, hi, <laughs> like that. And when you go to the table, everybody's sitting at that end, you hear it this end. <laughs> you know, nobody passes you anything, you gotta get up and get it. <laughs> yeah, I went through that. <laughs> so anyways, but I was scared because now, you know, my wife was absolutely positive I was I was such a dummy that I would lose the money you know so there's the not only is she mad because that got the took them sold the house but then the 86 I was probably gonna blow it so she wanted six thousand at least pay the rent you know because now we're not at home so I did that and so I was scared because I absolutely could not lose this money if I did I'd really be in deep water so anyways that's how I started off in fight in the foreclosure game. Um, and so I needed money, 86,000 or the 80 I had left. Uh, back in those days, I could, I, would, I could swing a deal if I was bidding on a junior lien, because they weren't as big as the foreclosure were first, okay? And, uh, and, the, and so uh, there's only about three of us in the whole county, four of us maybe at that time. The county at that time had about, I don't know, two, maybe three million people, you know? And uh, it was quite rare to, to have anybody be bidding on them. Now, if you were one of the four, okay, or five of us, 
there were so many foreclosures going across the courthouse steps that it would, uh, it's more than any of us even collectively could buy. And I'm talking perfectly good deals. Deals with a lot of equity in them, okay? And so, what's your first name? Guy. guy. So let's say Guy bought a deal, right? And he bought a damn good deal. Now, can he come back tomorrow and buy another one? Probably not, because he's got most of his money in the one he bought. So he's like a python. He's gonna go over, you know, and digest, you know, that warthog he ate or whatever it was, and uh, we're not gonna see him for a while. And so after a while, I was oftentimes found myself down at the courthouse steps with no com competition at all. Isn't that weird? That's how fantastic the market was. Well, <laughs> I'm greedy, <laughs> and so <laughs> I said, you know, I'm gonna get over. You know, I had this derisive term for investors, you know, I didn't want to get involved in the care and feeding of investors. I thought that was such a smart alecky remark. And I found out I really needed them. And so, uh, and when you do, you you got to have paperwork for them. I found out I would call someone, uh, no, and I would meet them at Denny's for breakfast or something and talk about foreclosures. And I went all over the place. And I didn't have the an organized approach to explain them, especially paperwork-wise. And so they were confused. Nobody wants to, you know, invest in something when the guy confused them, all right? So I needed a better approach. So I needed an entity. So the entity I needed, I didn't want it to be a limited partnership. And so I went to a uh, Saturday, uh, Potpourri of uh, real estate speakers one time. I got free tickets, so okay, I'll go there. And uh, uh, sat in the back of the room where all the uh, wise guys sit, you know, in high school, the real smart ones are way in the back. And all that. So, anyways, I was back there, and uh, a, a second speaker got up and he was talking on something I never heard of in my life, even though I went to law school, I never heard of it. And this is, was the uh, Illinois Land Trust. And the more he talked, I just, holy smokes, that's the answer that I need to put my deal together. And so forget having fun in the back and on and on and on. And I just, put, I told the guy, sorry, I'll, I'll be back the next speaker, but I'm going to go up front and listen to this guy. And I did. And to this day, I call him the great Maltino. It was Philip Maltino, and he was an attorney from uh, where Nixon came from. What city was that? Whittier. 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 Right? And he was talking about this thing, the title trust. I couldn't believe it. My jaw must have been uh, like this. And uh, so when he was done, I jump up, you know, I give him my card. <laughs> and I'd say, hey, you know, I got to talk to you about this. So I'll call me Monday morning. So, and I ended up paying him a thousand bucks. Can you imagine that? 1982, paying a thousand bucks for a trust. I go up to Whittier, you know, I bring my cashier's check, and I give it to the receptionist, and I kind of ask, uh, you know, was Mr. Martino in? I expect for a thousand bucks, the guy would talk to me for a little bit. Well, he's in conference. <laughs> so I give him a thousand, I get back an envelope with about six pieces of paper in it. <laughs> and I on back to San Diego. You know, first I was irritated. And then I said, he didn't do anything wrong. I'm stupid. I didn't watch out for Ward Hannigan. You know? I just, and, I, and the more I thought about it, I said, dummy, you went to law school. You got all kinds of great grades in law school and this and that. You don't need that guy. You can go to law library, research it, you know? And then I went to law library. Found out that what he gave me he copied for you know, a nickel a page out of the forms book. Um, and I, but I can't get angry at the guy because, you know, he was the that, that, that missing element I needed to, you know, show me just that little thing. So I've been using the trust ever since, okay? All right. So now look at the first page here. You got your hand up, right? And it says the components of a real estate deal. And so we have 
the a California general partnership is now necessary. I'm talking about when I first got started, none of this stuff did we need other than an entity to hold title to the property. Now why do we need an entity other than ourselves, or other than our investors? Why couldn't we just hold it in tenants in common, a tick, right? So each one has an actual ownership of uh, a certain percentage of the title to the property. And their name is on the, on the, on the property and, and a percentage named after that. How many people think that's a great idea? Nobody, okay. A lot of television. Right, now, you see, you don't want, the minute you put your title, you get attached to the title of real property, all of your baggage <coughs> attaches to it too. So all that negative stuff, all right, uh, the, that maybe you might have an outstanding judgment, or maybe you're being sued for divorce, or you're planning on being sued for divorce, or something like that, uh, then you know your wife's not going to let you uh, sell your asset until you have an agreeable uh, distribution of property, and so uh, just to make sure that uh, you know, she gives you a little grief. <laughs> She's going to take her sweet time doing it. You know? Well, you know, how does that work when you got a buyer who wants to close escrow, you know, at the end of the month, and now you got one of your partners that has an, an uh, undivided interest in this property. He's right on title. You can't get the wife to sign. You really can't do that to your investors. You've got to have some kind of entity that doesn't matter what's going on in the personal life of your individual investors. Does that make sense to all you guys? Okay. And so, there's a lot we can do. We can put it in a limited partnership, but Ward hates that because uh, he's gonna have to have you know, unlimited liability. Uh, you can put it in a corporation, you can put it in, a, in all varieties of corporations, in the C Corp, the S Corp, yada, yada, yada Corp. And um, so, and then you can have an LLC, and all that kind of stuff. But one thing I hate about that is it makes, it's very public. All your investors, whoever they are, are all in the public record somewhere. And so if we could do this and have a tremendous amount of privacy, that'd be better, okay? And so and I can tell you in my life, I've had smugglers who are my investors. Nobody knew it, okay? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, you know, and not too many people want to, eh, come on, hell, more than Mary. And so, but, um, so you need to have something. I like the trust. Now, I was just personally using the trust for myself initially for a couple of years, and uh, it helped me sell a property when the wife didn't think I should, and stuff like that. And then I, uh, start using it with my investors. So now, and that's all you need. You just needed a trust. And that's why we're going to talk a little bit about a trust. Some paperwork here for that. And then you need this other stuff in order to make the trust work flawlessly. Okay? So the trust itself is not enough nowadays. Back in 82 when I started, yes. It was a whole enchilada. You didn't need anything else, All right? But now, you need a California general partnership. Why? Because California law, the regulations changed in 2004, and uh, the state of California says, okay, uh, we're taking a, a break away from the California citizens. Now we want you to have to, if you're flipping property and uh, real property, we want you, or escrow, to take out of your proceeds a, a percentage of the sales price as an advance payment on your state income tax. And so a lot of you probably have heard of that. That's that 3.3 times the sales price, which is way, way, way overestimate because it's not a percentage of your profit. It's a percentage of the gross sales price. That hit in 2004. Now, in 2004, I was speculating in a... Uh, property, I bought a lot at 120000 and it was a steal. And so I knew I could sell it almost immediately and flip it for about twice that, $240,000, $250,000. And 
It was an incredible lot. And uh, so I bought the lot, and uh, then I had to, because I used to sell land on weekends, and as a land salesman, uh, it's hard for your prospect to visualize what they can use this land for. You had to kind of like paint a picture for them. Well, you put the garage over here, and the tennis court there, and the pool there, and yada, yada, yada. And that was effective. That got people dreaming about what they could do with this, this lot you're trying to sell. So I decided to do that with this lot that I bought to flip. And the more I started making up this, this uh, hypothetical house, the more fun I was having. And uh, foreclosures were really you know, sliding down, so I had lots of time. So I asked my wife, I said, honey, why don't we just build this house? So she said, sure. You know, by the way, the way she got over this, the way I, I schemed it so she got over it, is the very next, next house I bought, I put in her name and her trust. That's the way it is today. So if you ever come visit me sometime and all my crap's on the driveway, <laughs> she's had enough. See you later, pal. It's my house, free and clear. But anyways, so um, what was I talking about? <laughs> Dreaming. The land. Oh, 3.3. Thank you very much. 3.33. 3.33. By the way, is any, we need somebody that's really persnickety in this room. I mean, they really get ticked off if I don't keep my word. All right, so my word is we got a break. Do a break halfway between us. So when is, yeah, when is, okay. Huh? You'll be done about 9.15, we're hoping. So you want me to break you halfway through? And so, halfway through. So let's say 8.45? 8.45? About probably 15 be. minutes. Okay, in 15 okay. minutes. Yeah, so somebody, all right, call me on that because 15 minutes. I'll be off in a while through yonder and I'll forget <laughs> it. All right. So, um, anyways, I, I actually went, I told my wife, I said, honey, why don't we build this house? Okay, and she said, well, doesn't matter to me. So I had the thousands and thousands of dollars that were idle because I wasn't playing the foreclosure game. And uh, so I said, okay, I'm gonna sell this lot, I'm gonna build the house. So I built the house. When I was finished, I had 900,000 bucks in it. And uh, I sold it for a million five. Okay, so how much money did I make? I heard the million five. <laughs> <laughs> and then the 900,000 is cut. Okay. So, anyhow, I made, uh, what? 600,000. Um, and it's in a trust. I always name a trust after the street it's on. The street was Emerald Heights Road, so it was called the Emerald Trust. And it was Eric Hannigan, my son, trustee of the, the Emerald Trust. And um, so I was oblivious to. Uh, what uh, California was going to do in early 19, in 2004, and I was just ready to sell the house. And I found out this changed, and uh, God, I couldn't couldn't believe it, you know, that uh, because I took 3.3 times a million and a half, that's 49,500 bucks that they want to take out of my proceeds, all right, and uh, as advance payment on my uh, towards my state income tax deal. And uh, Omi just wasn't going to do that. Okay. <laughs> so, huh, you know, I got out the law books. Why the hell did I go to law school? So I got out the books and, and looked at this and found out there were some exceptions. And the exception is that if the owner of this property is a multi-member entity, then you can get a pass and you don't have that to have that deducted. I said, well, great, a trust's got multiple members, right? Trustor, trustee, Benny, blah, blah, blah. No, state of California says, for this, for, in this instance, a trust is not a multi-member entity. We're gonna call it a single member entity. Darn. So I thought about that for about two minutes. I said, well, wait a second. If I create one trust, Guy, do you think I could create another one? 
probably, okay? So if you have two of anything, right, then it's multi-member. So I said, great, Eric, take this property, we're gonna deed it, and so Eric Canning, trustee of the Emerald Trust, deeds it to the Emerald Partnership, a California general partnership, all right, with the Emerald Trust is one partner, and this was tough, because I had to think about this for about three minutes. <laughs> ah, the Meridian Trust. I like the word Meridian, okay? And so I named it the Meridian Trust. So Eric was the trust, he was one partner, right? Eric, trustee of the Emerald Trust, and it was Financial Fitness LLC, my LLC, as the trustee of the Meridian Trust. So me and me got together, okay? <laughs> now, who do, you, who do you think owned the Emerald Trust? Me. And who owned the Meridian Trust? Me, all right? So did I have to trust anybody? <laughs> Pardon? Now in my case, maybe, okay? Yeah, I might have my right hand slapping my left. Hey, stay out <laughs> So anyways, uh, and it went right through escrow. Not a worry world, it was fantastic. So I gotta teach you guys then to do what? Create a general partnership. Okay, and there's three entities the state of California allows us to wheel and deal in real estate without a license, okay? And so, one is obviously the trust, right? You don't have to register or record the trust with the state of California. Since you don't, you have to pay an annual fee to the Secretary of State? No, okay, fine. An individual, okay, doesn't need to register with the state, and a general partnership. By the way, it has to be a California general partnership. Don't bring an Arizona partnership over or any other place, a California general partnership. And so, uh, fine, it's so simple to do. You can go down to Staples, buy a pad of general partnership forms, you know, single page, and write that up, and that's just as good. I thought a title company might think that's a little bit too flimsy, so, I created one that's got three pages or four pages, but probably not any better than Ben Staples, okay? It's not a big deal. So all I needed two partners. All right, and so that's the reason why we have the California General Partnership there. What do you need? You need a partnership agreement with your investors, okay? And uh, so the partner, the investors though, <laughs> are not just your cash investors, this partnership agreement, it just has the two parties, okay? So one of the investors is, uh, has all the power, and the other investor doesn't. So if you look on this chart, you got there? Mm -hmm. Look on there, it says, you know, a big blank, uh, and so put whatever name you want in there. I put the Emerald Partnership, the California General Partnership, and so it's the one that gets the, the uh, EIN number, the tax reporting number from uh, IRS's website. It's the one that uh, you've got to create the vesting for, the public vesting. It's one that'll probably get the checking account. If you have a problem getting a checking account, well, not, a partnership shouldn't be a problem, but if you have a problem getting a checking account for a trust, then call up the, uh, my bank not my bank, but the bank that I, I have uh, cultivated uh, in my area. And uh, so my area is called what? It's B of A, right? Yeah, it's the Bank of America, but the neighborhood. Forget the neighborhood. Bel Air? <laughs> That's too fancy. <laughs> <laughs> Bel Air, no. It's called... Mission I'll, Viejo? No, I'll think about it in a minute. But anyways, you want to call up that Bank of America because I've groomed them to the manager, assistant manager, and, and on and on, three people there, in some case, one's on vacation. And they are very, very comfortable opening up a, a bank account for a trust. You can have lots, lots of times because banks don't do that too often, it's kind of difficult to get it done, okay? And so, if you open it up at Bank of America, then it doesn't matter if you open it up, why the hell is the name of that? Grantville, you remember that? Grantville. Grantville, that's the name of the neighborhood bank, the branch bank, 
Bank of America. Yes, sir. Hey, Warren, Pacific Premier just did one for us, too. Who? Pacific Premier Bank. Okay. The thing is, see, the whole, or, in other words, if you walk into any Bank of America, okay, they're not going to, they're, they're not going to want to open up a trust. It's got to be someone that you've already <coughs> groomed, they're familiar with it, they're comfortable with it, and this and that. And so open it there in Grantville or wherever you want, okay, and then you got an account, you got a Bank of America account in your town, all right, and so now you can do everything in and out of that, you know, for convenience, but the entity, all right, originally opened up that account in Grantville. Okay? That help you? Grantville. And it's not the name of a city, it's the name of a area, a neighborhood. Okay? So it's a Grantville station. And by the way, John Walker is the manager. Okay? Miguel. Uh, Chavarria, C H A R V I A, Chavarria, something like that. He's the assistant manager, and, uh, and I'll remember the uh, the gal's name in a couple minutes. Okay. All right. So the general partnership then it's the one. It's an beta, by the way, of two partners. You've got a non-authorized partner, non-authorized to do what? They're not authorized to sign anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's where all your passive money investors are. All right, so they own this trust, which is one of the partners. So down here, using my Emerald partnership, this would be the Emerald Trust, and that's the one that is the money investors. Okay, the authorized partner is you. Okay, you sign everything. All right? Now you're probably going to do it either having an entity like a C Corp LLC a trust, or a person. Now the reason I got question marks behind that, you know, like, really? No, because this is the, this is the, ex the exposure that you're, this is what the public sees, is the managing partner. This is what the public sues, if they've got some heartache about that, okay? So you don't want to be there, standing there, and be sued, you know, personally. Right? That's not really cool. I can tell you that person. I got it. <laughs> it's a funny thing. I bought a foreclosure. The guy was uh, upset, the, Lord, the owner, you know. And so he concocted this idea that Ward Hannigan and the Bank of America um, colluded together to screw him out of his house. Okay? It didn't. The fact that he didn't make payments for 12 months or something had nothing to do with the foreclosure. So I was named. The lawsuit went against Bank of America on one side, and then it went against uh, financial, no, this was Ward Hannigan, because I was the trustee at that time. So it was Ward Hannigan, trustee of the Blah Blah Trust. And then a third time, okay, Ward Hannigan. Now, could I walk away from that deal? No, because they would take a default judgment against me. By the way, I was being sued, and Bank of America and I were being sued for $5 million. Now, think about this. Let's say I'm standing here in front of you guys right now, and I want to raise some money from you, okay? How many people we got here? Probably 30,000 apiece? Yeah, that's pretty good. I get $30,000 from all you guys, right? Now, you find out that I'm subject to a $5 million lawsuit right now, an appending lawsuit. Now how many people wanna <laughs> give me $1,000, right? None. And so this can really put a kink in your, you know, your operations, even though it's a stupid lawsuit. While it's still pending, most of the public doesn't know that, so they're gonna be safe, and you're not gonna be able to win a deal. So you don't want, even though this is a specious lawsuit, it's gonna be very easy for you to ultimately kill it. During that time period, it can raise some havoc. My FICO score went from over 800 down to like, you know, the bottom. <coughs> and uh, my bank called me up. They wanted to call my loans. I had three uh, unsecured loans for a quarter of a million each. That's 750,000, and I got a little bit nervous. Eh. You know, is everything okay, Ward? 
<laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So I said, yeah. I said, if you're nervous about this, then you just let me know, and in 10 days, I'll come in and pay you off. And okay, so it would take me a couple days to get the three quarters of a million dollars, move some stuff around, and so, oh, no, 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 you don't have to pay us off, they're just wondering. So you don't want that to happen. All right. So we have the property management entity, all right? And so um, I would use the word management in whatever kind of title you got. If you like the word Windsor, then it would be the Windsor Management Corp. The word management is, is, is magic, okay? And uh, so that's the one that would rent uh, the property out. That's the one that would hire the you know, the plumber, blah, 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 all that stuff. The public contact would be that um, management entity. And then you're going to need an investment agreement, okay, between you and your investors. Every single one of your investors should have a, a direct contract with you. You don't put them all together, and then as a group, they have a contract with you. No, 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 no. Each one is going to be, uh, has their own separate contract. Why? Because when you go from deal to deal, sometimes the, the investors that were part of that deal, you know, aren't going to be a part of this deal. And so you get a lot more mobility if you're dealing with individuals rather than a group. Okay. Board. Yeah. Are this being a California general partnership? Does that mean that the the non-authorized partners do they need to be kept from California or do they be from any place? They can be from any place. Okay, the question was... you repeat what he said for the individual? Yes. Okay, the question was... Sorry. It's all right. It's all right. The, the question was, you know, can you have out-of-area investors or do your investors also have to be California? And the answer is no. In fact, nobody's going to know who your investors are. Okay, not even the state of California. Okay, they're not part of the title. Okay. Anyhow, that's the answer to that. Um, now, what do you take to escrow with this partnership? Well, you got to take the general partnership agreement, okay, and then you got to you got to have a statement of partnership dash general. Okay, why? Now, the state of California says you do not have to record your general partnership with the state. What's good about that is then the public doesn't know about your partnership, right? They don't know who the partners are and on and on. You run into a problem because the title companies, and I think rightly so, do not want to have their source of who the partners are, you. They don't want you telling them because maybe they don't trust you, and they shouldn't probably, all right? So they want to be able to go to an independent archive and verify for themselves who the partners are. Because if they don't, and then all of a sudden there's more partners in that should have been involved in this purchase or sale, and they didn't know about it because they took your word, then they're on a hook, okay? So they want to know. So we'll wait. Now, if you don't register the, it's called the GP1. Okay, so if you don't register the GP1 with the state of California, then what's the alternate? The alternate is you do a statement of partnership dash general and record it in the county in which the property, the real property is located. Bam. Yes, ma'am. 15 minutes. Huh. 15 minutes. So let me ask you guys a question. I'm famous for having lamp light lectures. So after we're done here, because we're going to be kicked out, you know, and they want to put the chairs back and all that crap. Is there a place around this hotel where we can continue? You die hard, you know, we could. There's, a, there's a, cafe, a cafe, it's right here in the lobby. We've nah. already ordered you dinner. Yeah, yeah but a cafe, I mean, some people can hear us and not. Where's some place where we can, we can do stand up and just talk? Then you'll leave faster, see, because they get tired. Well, we, can stay, we officially can stay in this room till 2 a.m. Ah! 
dynamite. They don't kick us out. Two a.m. Well, they will after two. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> right, let's put it this way. We've stayed here till 12.30 and they haven't kicked us out. So that's okay. that much I know. Well, you want to test that limit? <laughs> I got nothing else to do than I go up. <laughs> that's all right with me. We'll just grab the food, bring it in here. Yeah. Okay. Cool, I'll do that. Eat in front of all you guys. Okay. So, 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 but you said you wanted to be, why do you want me to interrupt you in 15 minutes? Okay, so what we're going to give away is four free hours with me in San Diego. Some of you have already done that with me in this room. All right. And uh, so let's see what that's worth. I get 250 bucks an hour for consulting. And I do it frequently and I get paid that on a regular basis. Okay. So what's four times 250? A thousand bucks. So I'm giving you, you know, a thousand dollars worth of of coming down San Diego and spending four hours for me. And I'm not going to charge anything. That's what you paid for your first trust. <laughs> That's right. I'm trying to get that back. <laughs> so, anyhow, uh, and then I got the next 45 days, okay? And uh, we found out somebody in this room bought one of these probably five years ago, okay? And has never used it. No. Okay. Wow. I know. Can you believe it? Yeah. At this type of auction, at this type of a meeting, very much like this, where they were selling the Ward Hannigan four hour certificate, and I am the one who bought it, and I did not use it. Okay. Defray this, because this usually goes up to a pretty good number. So you, you can defray that by uh, bringing Split. a couple of other people with you. And so now it's not just you, but let's say you bid, you know. Something I can divide by three, so that'd be six hundred. All right, that'd be two hundred dollars each. So now it's not costing you so much because your buddies are paying another two hundred so, each. So, Ward, I think you have some people here in the room who's taken advantage of this this before. Yeah. Are, they, are you guys willing to raise your hand if you guys have talked with Ward? Is it worth it? Right. Well, no. Yeah. Give it. Let's hear. Just, just saying, this is you know, this is people have done this before. Would you suggest you people with the hands up that? that uh, people haven't done it should do it. Yeah. I guess it's paying a lot for it. I suggest you bring something to eat. You plan on being there for like 12 hours. It's not yeah. four hours. <laughs> 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 right from the van. If, you if I tell day. people it's not going to eat, going to eat, so then he's there. Yeah, I don't go there. I forget about it. I'm having so much fun. I just they got snacks. Huh? They got snacks. We got snacks. I have diabetes, so we had to get rid of all the good stuff. <laughs> Until we got nuts, almonds, so we got so, so it's literally four plus hours of his personal time and advice to apply to your investment strategy. And it's on any topic, as long as it's re uh, real estate related. Okay? But, so it's not training, okay? I don't have a training set up, it's just I'm, we're, I'm going to respond to your questions and as deep as you want to go. And so if you come with more than uh, yourself, then of course that second person wants to ask questions too and the third person. Okay. So I personally like that because if I was, uh, sometimes I can work off of, or things that pop up that somebody else mentioned and they go, oh wow, yeah, hey, how about that? You know, and stuff like that. Other times people prefer to come by themselves. So two things. Pete, you want to say something real quick? Well, I just want to say in 2011, I spent a whole day with Ward uh, with Trust. And by the way, I had the flu that day. I was feeling like crap. Oh, I didn't even know it. I, I drove all the way back. I didn't and, even care. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of didn't think about it until the next deal came up. And then I'm digging and scratching for the book. For the book and the notes. And right. the hours that Ward's put into me after doing the training, I, I, I couldn't even calculate them. So it, it's... It, Dollar for dollar, the best money I ever spent since I got in this business. All right, and, and so. the proceeds of this certificate go to? Go to Phoebe. They go to this meeting. Okay, so, so it goes right he back to the organization. To this meeting, okay. that way I can have, we're moving to a larger room, I haven't announced it yet, but as many, as many as we can, we're moving to a larger room, that's why we increase the prices here, so the but proceeds I, will go to having know, more space. I have so much fun doing it, you know, that, uh, I don't need money anymore. So, you guys can have it, whatever. I just get 
right. more victims come down Shoot. to San Diego. More victims come talk to you. Actually, I really have an agenda. And the agenda is I want to keep this thing up here as as vigorous and as knowledgeable and as on and on and on. And I sense that if I keep going over this stuff on and on and on, I'll be able to do it longer and longer and longer. Okay, should we All start right. the bidding? So let's start the bidding out. Right. Let's do it start the $100 increments, okay? And, um, and so right. who wants to pay? Nicole? Who bids 100 You're gonna, you're gonna need your idea. Here's 100. Okay, Nicole, 100. Elizabeth's 200. Okay. Brian, 400. <laughs> He's four. He went to four, I, he said four, right? Oh, he held up four fingers. Four fingers, 400. <laughs> Anybody gonna beat 400? Five. Go on once. Five, five, you guys already did. Five, <laughs> all right. Six. Six. Wow. Come on. Six hundred going once. Six hundred going once. Six hundred going oh, twice. We got seven. Seven. Seven hundred going once. Seven hundred once. going once. Twice. Twice. Third and final. Right there. Oh, no, where? right there. Eight hundred. Eight hundred. Eight hundred. All right, come on, guys. Once. Come on. This is getting hot now. Come on. Come on. We got nine hundred right here. Nine hundred. Nine hundred. Right here. Nine hundred. One from the audience. Nine hundred. No, nine hundred. Going twice. Going twice. I'm looking. Third and final call. All right. That's it. Come on 800. up here, 800. It has a map of how to get to my place and a business card, but it's not going to get it until you. Write me the check. Yeah. All right. <laughs> this is real estate card. By the way, you can call me up, and I'll make whatever your schedule demands. Uh, if it's at least a week in advance, I can meet any day. I don't care if it's holidays or, you know, Saturday and Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, whatever. Okay. Okay. Right. So, Lord, you got about 25 minutes to, to finish this. No, I had up to 2 a.m. You said. <laughs> no, 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 no. I have to. I have to give a break to these guys at 25 minutes for those who want to leave. Oh. They need to be able to leave. We can't Good. keep them all till 2 a.m. I know they're cute. We want to keep each and every one of them. No, no, no. That's all right. I'm just saving the good stuff for last. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you've been warned. All right. Good work, Lord. All right. Here's your papers. Thank you very much. Well, so, yeah. yes, ma'am. Uh, I was. I just wanted to make sure. So, in, in the general partnership agreement, are you supposed to? You said you have to sign an agreement with each person, or for each? No. Trust? That's apart from the general partnership. You're going to have an individual. In, uh, investment agreement, real estate investment agreement with that individual. Each individual. Each individual. Each and some of those individuals will want to be in this deal you got. Okay. So and others not. want to be in that deal you got. That sort of thing. Right, but it's not. It's not. I don't lock it into. Yeah. It. So what I do though is when we've got it, then let's say I've got four people. Now what we want to, we don't want to have the uh, our names on any sliver of that ownership, so then we create a trust, right. okay? And then that trust you own. Yes, sir? This is a little off your summit you're on right now, but I understand you have a yearly summit thing that you use that or have been having. Yeah. You still do that? No. I'm thinking colleagues. of starting up again, okay? I don't think, Peter, you ever came to one, did you? The alumni, no. Yeah, yeah. but Dallin did, right, Dallin? Yeah. You came to more than one, right? Yeah. So basically what we have is we have a reunion, an annual reunion. And everybody who has taken my class, doesn't matter how many years ago, can come. And what we want to do is just do what you guys did earlier this evening, and that is network. Because when I train people, I train you in isolation, don't I? Yeah. yeah. All right, so you don't get to meet other people who have the same kind of interest that you do because it's not with 20, 30, 40 people, all right? And so how can I address that? So we address it by having an annual reunion. So it usually was on the, was it the last Saturday in February every year yeah. or something like that? And uh, you could bring a guest and stuff like that. Um, but since the foreclosure, since I basically stopped uh, training foreclosures, I don't have a number of the ever a growing number of, of trainees to attend that meeting. And so that means instead of 120 showing up, we might have 60 or we might have 40. And so that would mean I would have to subsidize it. So 
I didn't want to go that deep in my pocket, so I just, you know, closed up shop. So I'm thinking of having it again, though, and uh, because it's uh, it's not just foreclosures, as Dallin knows, that we talk about, it, or even you know. So I don't know. I'll start thinking about it. Okay. So um, let's see. Let's, we were going on the trust. What I want to do is real fast. I'm going to read these things off so we can get through it a little bit faster. This is tr trust in a nutshell, and that's what I want to get over, get with you guys tonight because uh, it's not that difficult, I find, to understand if I can, you can take it in little bites. So the principles of any trust, there are about as many trusts as there are leaves on a tree. And so the principles of any trust, okay, there's three. We've got a creator of the trust, we've got an administrator of the trust, and we've got an owner of the trust. So now I have to teach you some trust vernacular, okay? So the owner of a trust is known as what? Trust. Beneficiary. Beneficiary, okay? The administrator of a trust is known as? Trustee. Trustee, all right? And then the creator of the trust is known as? Trustor. Trustor. Now you notice that under the ellipse for the administrator and the owner, there are no alternative terms. Everybody, no matter what, calls the owner of a trust a beneficiary. Everybody in the world, no matter what, calls the administrator a trustee. But boy, do we have a variety of words to use for the <coughs> trustor. And to me, it's ridiculous because, you know, the trustor is really not the kingpin in this whole thing. But these, most of these end in OR. So Ed, what's an alternative word for the uh, trustor? <laughs> yeah, it's right there. I need another one. Okay. Well, uh, with attorneys, they call the, the trustor a settlor. So it's S C T T L O R. They, the another party, uh, uh, some old real estate fogies will call it a grantor. Okay. If we're doing something of a charitable nature and we're going to band together and put an orphanage in uh, Afghanistan or something, then that uh, party who's coming up with all the money is called a what? No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever give blood? Donor. Okay. And then down here, uh, if it's just somebody from the general public, oftentimes they'll say the maker. Okay. So I go over this because there used to be some confusion in people's minds. Um, after I taught them, they'd say, well, wait a second, I heard this other word being used. And what's that mean? All right, number one, a trust is created by filling out and signing the trust agreement, okay? Now, above the word agreement, write declaration as an alternate um, word. The reason I do that is because I had a title, title officer one time, incredibly, once said that my trust was invalid because the heading for it Instead of it being trust agreement, I used trust declaration. So, oh my God. So it's a fine. So we use two terms, agreement and declaration. All right, so it's cre trust is created by filling out and signing the trust agreement by who? Trustor and trustee. And by transferring the title of the property, personal property, into the name of the trust. Wait a second, Ward. I thought there's three parties to this trust. Yeah. Well, how come only two sign? What happened to the beneficiary? Why does a beneficiary not have to sign the trust? No. They do own it, but that's not the reason. Well, they might. But could you have a beneficiary, a minor? Okay, and so is them signing anything significant? No. Let's say they're an adult, but you don't want them to know about this trust because you may want to change your mind later on and see how they turned out. Okay, so you don't want to have them sign that too. So it's very, very, very common 
all right, not to have a beneficiary sign the trust. Now, why is that fabulous from a privacy point of view? No public record. There's no, well, not only public, but a title company, okay, uh, isn't going to know who your, uh, who the beneficiaries are. So they're not going to run them through the general index. Who did I teach about general index tonight? <laughs> what? Did I catch you? Did, did I waste the time I talked with you? Or, huh? We talked about the general index. That's not the right. What's the general index? You should see her frowning. Her <laughs> oh, well, what we talked about a little bit earlier at a water break was that um, if you want to research the title of the property, don't be passive. Don't be just satisfied with the voluntary liens that you would get from a title company, right? What other kind of liens do you want? You want, you want negative liens, right? You got positive liens and negative liens. That makes up the title record to the property, okay? Where do you find the negative liens? The general index. Are you ever gonna get a general index voluntarily from a title company? No, okay? All right. Positive lien you put on the property yourself. Okay, you want to borrow money? All right, you willingly will sign a deed of trust to secure that, right? But if I get a, a judgment against you, okay, then I don't care about it. I, I'm going to record it against your property anyways, or an IRS lien and all that. So the reason title companies don't want to disclose that, those negative liens, to the public is sometimes the person who is affected pays them off. You might pay off the judgment you owe me, but because you're an ordinary person, you don't realize that that doesn't take it off the, the that mark off the title of your property. You have to record, you have to get from me a satisfaction of judgment. And then you record the satisfaction of judgment. So lots of times there's these things that have been taken care of, but from the public record point of view, there haven't been, all right? So title companies have been satisfied, I mean, sued by homeowners uh, for an old war uh, tort called the slander of title. And so they said, hey, you should have, you know, should not have said that I owe Ward Handy at 60,000 because I paid him off three years ago. The title company says, well, geez, you didn't put anything in the public record, so how are we supposed to know? So they don't want to create those nuisance lawsuits, and so to prevent that, they just don't give out that information to the public that's calling them up and asking them. Is this satisfaction the same thing as a release of lien? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, here we go, number two, the signatures on a trust declaration must be notarized? No. No. Well, wait a second, okay? Aren't 99% of all trusts notarized? Yeah. Yeah, but they don't have to be. Well, what's so cool about that? Because you can date it any damn day you want, okay? But if you have a notary notarizing it, she's gonna put down the exact day, okay? And so that might be a little bit, uh, you lose a little bit of versatility. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, number three, an attorney is required to create a trust. No. Again, 99% of all trusts are created by attorneys. Okay? So many people in this room would think that they're inadequate to create their own trust because, gee, 99% of the people get attorneys to do it for them. Oh, when you see how simple it is, you go, <laughs> why would I ever hire an attorney? Okay. <laughs> Number four, a, any competent adult person or legal entity can function as a trustee? Yes. Five, all trusts have a trustor, trustee, and beneficiary. The differences between the many varieties of a trust are generally due to adjusting the provisions of the declaration of trust so as to increase or decrease the powers of the trustor, trustee, and beneficiary. Now in this trust, 
This is the current, this is the modern version of the Illinois Land Trust that was created in 1892 by Chicago Title, okay? And uh, 1982, when I started using it, and I was using the Illinois Land Trust for California transactions, I constantly ran into this buzzsaw of people saying, well, is that legal, Ward? I mean, you know, is that, you know, we're using the land trust for Illinois here in California, don't, don't we have a California land trust? So, uh, uh, Chicago Title ran into the same problem when they expanded outside the borders of Illinois and their deals, we had to, you know, all of a sudden people are, are wondering why, if you're in <coughs> Iowa, why are we using a, a, a Illinois trust? So they dropped the word Illinois. And when they dropped the word Illinois, it didn't solve their problem because now it was confused <coughs> with a land trust that was came out about 100 years before Chicago Title came up with uh, their trust, and uh, that's used for conservancy purposes. You have private owners who are taking some gorgeous areas they own and putting it in trust for the benefit of the public. In fact, it's the forerunner of our national parks. Okay. So that's why Teddy Roosevelt, when he started having getting the federal government in and, and putting these areas aside in perpetuity, you know, was what he saw was happened back in the colonial days. Okay. Um, so we have here the differences between the many varieties are generally adjusting to the provisions to increase or decrease the powers of the trust or trustee Benny. Now sometimes you don't want the Benny to have the power in the trust because it might be that kid or it might be that, you know, that the, the youngster that you might wonder how they're going to grow up or something like that. So I, for example, I have three boys. Uh, the, my youngest son suffered a severe, severe brain injury and as a consequence, uh, when he recovered, um, he did not recover a sense of a money sense. You give him five bucks, he'll spend it today. You give him a thousand bucks, he'll spend it today. You can give him 10,000 bucks, he'll spend it today. Well, when the wife and I die, he's, his share of the estate will be probably in the millions. And so, you know, but what do you think you do with that? <laughs> Spend it, you know? And so it defeats the whole thing because we need to make sure that it's going to last for his life, you know, and not be sucked away from him by, you know, near dwells. So we have a special needs trust entirely different. Okay. And so that's, um, you know, why we have um, the power has been shifted. Because this, this trust here is normally the beneficiary. Because the beneficiary has, the beneficiary has all the power in a Illinois land trust, or what's uh, then called the land trust, and then now it's called, since 1992, what it does. And I love that <coughs> moniker that's called a title holding trust. Very descriptive of what it, what's its purpose. <clears throat> Basically to hold title to property, all right, in order to give a tremendous amount of privacy to the beneficiaries or to the owner of the trust. All right, uh, six, it's quite simple to name a trust in such a way to avoid confusion with any other <laughs> trust operating in the same locale. All that's required is the inclusion of three items. Hearing first should be the name of the trustee, next the name of the trust, and finally the trust creation date. For example, Todd Adams, trustee of the Swift Trust, dated 2 3 okay? Um, the trust assets. The assets of a trust collectively form the? Corpus. Corpus, corpus Latin for what? Body. Body, okay? Or the alternative, if you're not rarely going to hear, you'll read it more frequently than you'll hear it, and it's called res, R-E-S. The res stands for the residue. Okay. Eight, the current owner of real estate is referred to as the blank and shows as the recipient on the face of the most current recorded deed to the property. What so, was that one again? Okay, the current owner of real property <coughs> or real estate is referred to as the blank. So, guys, anybody know what that is? Huh? 
Grantee, perfect. A nine. By the way, folks, I'm partially blind in my left eye. Or excuse me, I don't have left peripheral vision in the left eye. I don't have left per peripheral vision in my right eye. So you guys over here, if you think I'm ignoring you, <laughs> I just don't see you. <laughs> we just don't see you, you know? So if it looks like I'm, I'm turning to the right all the time, by the way, if you ever walk with me, <coughs> make sure you walk on my right side, because otherwise I'll be climbing over your feet. <laughs> um, nine. nine. For a trust to become the owner of real property, we did that. No, no. no. What, so, okay, for a trust to become the owner of real property, a blank would have to be recorded, transferring the title of the property from the current owner, that's you, to your trust. So what would you have to record? Yes. Or a regular deed. Just a deed, could be a grant deed, could be a quit claim deed, okay? Um, the transfer of title from yourself to your trust via recorded deed is judged to have the effect of a sale of the property. How many people say yes? How many people say no? The no. no's have it, okay? So, um, but that's gonna be the presumption of the rest of the world outside this room. Okay. The presumption is that uh, if they don't see your name, you know, this uh, the vesting of property, the way it handles the title, you have the grantor, right, deeding the property to the grantee. If you ever want to remember that, okay, grantee rhymes with receiving. So the party receiving title is the grantee. Okay. So who's the party who's receiving rent? The lessee? Who's the party that is the payee? <laughs> well, let's get Beneficiary? The check. <laughs> yes, beneficiary. <laughs> okay. So, um, we got for the trust to become the owner of real property, okay, D. Now, this is going to create some problems. If you want the greatest privacy, you cannot have your name smeared in a public record on the title of that property. So it's got to go from Mary Jones to, and you wouldn't have Mary Jones trustee because now the Jones name pops up, so you're going to have to have some other name, all right? And so you can either have a living person or you could have an entity, like I choose. I choose a title holding trust, oh, excuse me, a LLC, LLC. okay? So if we went from Mary Jones to me, we go Mary Jones to Financial Fitness LLC, trustee of the, you know, uh, what, Lincoln Trust, because it's on Lincoln Avenue. So nowhere would you see Mary Jones's name on the other side of the transaction. A copy of every deed that's recorded automatically goes to the assessor in your county. The assessor looks at that and tries to divine from that document if it was a sale or just merely a transfer. If they don't see your name on the other side of the transaction, then it's not a transfer, that's a sale. They'll send you a letter, kind of a drop dead letter, which just says if you don't contact us within the next 15 days and prove that it's, that it's just a transfer, then we're gonna assume it's a sale and gonna reassess your property, <coughs> okay? So, uh, you want to uh, do this, uh, and you need it. <laughs> I'm getting too deep. You don't have enough time, but uh, so. But believe me, there's a solution to this, and I'd be happy to share it with you whenever you run into the problem. Okay, just call me up. I plan on living another 20 years. Right. Huh? Pardon? That's a yes. Oh, no, it's not a yes. Well, no, it's a word. We're on 11 already? Wow. We were on 10 more. We were on 10. Okay. So once you transfer your assets to trust, you can never get them back. False. False. Unless it's what kind of trust? Irrevocable. Irrevocable. So now we got two kinds of trust. Revocable, where you're an Indian giver. You give it. You take it back, all right? 
And that, does that give you any privacy protection? Not privacy, but asset protection. Oh, no. no. Why? Because if it's revocable, then you have it permanently transferred it to somebody else. You're retaining control. By the word, way, write the word control down because that's what the, the assessor's always got to come back to, all right? And that's what they have this insatiable desire to try to, to see is who actually, how much of control of the property did you permanently transfer to somebody else? So they sort of avoid the word ownership. They talk in terms of control. So it's very simple to convince them, say, hey, I controlled the property 100% before I, I, I executed this deed, and I transferred it to my trust, okay? And I can show you a certification of trust which discloses that I am 100% owner of the trust. So if I took 100% of my property and transferred it 100% into my trust, then it's a transfer, it's not a sale. Okay? Okay, Lord, I'm going to be incredibly moved, but I have to keep my commitment to the group. So if you guys need to go home or you guys need a meeting or something like that, now we're going to take a just, we're not actually taking a break, but this is an opportunity for you to go ahead and grab your stuff, go ahead and stand up and leave, that way we're not interrupting anybody. But we're going to film you as you leave. We're going to film you as you leave, so as long as you're not committing this or anything. But uh, Ward's going to stay here and he's going to finish this, but this is your opportunity to take a quick break. All right. All right for those guys who do need to go, because it is after nine. So, sorry. Number 12. Okay. A blank trust such as the popular blank trust allows the trustor to arbitrarily shuffle a trust assets in and out of a trust anytime he or she wants. Let's go and fill the blanks. So what goes in the first blank? Revocable. A revocable trust uh, such as the popular living trust allows the trustor to arbitrarily shuffle the trust assets in and out. What's the classic example of that? You've got your property in a trust, right? Now you want to refi. You go to the bank for a loan, and they say, well, we can't make a loan, we can't make a loan to a trust, okay? Because it has no credit history, and yada, yada, yada. So uh, you're gonna have to take and revoke the trust, take it out of the trust name, put it in your name, all right? Then sign all the papers as an individual through that loan escrow, and then once it's recorded, what do they tell you to do? Put it back in the trust, okay? Well, who have you fooled? Nobody, because the public record's gonna show that, you know, the, the, the trust deeded the property out of its name to you, for the whole world to see, and then you borrowed a humongous amount of money that's a lot of power, right? To, to borrow a lot of money and put a second deed of trust on it. And then what'd you do? You popped it back into the trust? You know, so now if you got somebody coming at you with a lawsuit and you saying, well, I don't own the property, the trust does. <laughs> they go, really, <laughs> really? Look, here's this, when you borrowed some money, I mean, if you had nothing to do with the property, how did you convince the trust to disgorge its, uh, its property and borrow on it? So, yes. you know, now why, does, why do banks do that? Do you, does anybody here know why they are always going to want you to take the property out of your name, put it, or excuse me, out of the trust and put it in your name when you're borrowing? So they can find you. No. She said so they can find you. Okay. It has to do with Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae buys and started in the middle of 1935. In 1935, the federal government, okay, created Fannie Mae to provide a ready, willing, and able buyer, all right, to buy member banks' loans anytime. If it's on Christmas, they'll buy the loans on Christmas at a fair market price in order to stop runs on the bank. If you've ever studied the Great Depression, you'll realize one of the big weaknesses in our banking system was that uh, scared depositors would run down to the bank and get their money, and the bank doesn't have all the money 
that people deposit because it's got some of it out in loans. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if everybody wants all the money, how are they going to get the money out of the loans? And so the banks would fail. Mm -hmm. um, and so then the federal government said, ah, we got to provide a, a medium that is, stands there no matter what and is ready, able, and willing to buy those loans. When well, Fannie Mae buys these loans, they borrow against them because they got trillion dollars, you know, in these loans they own. So they put together what's called a tranche. Some of you guys know what that is, but it's a collection of, of uh, deeds of trust and promissory notes. And so who lends them money? Well, sovereign funds, so Saudi Arabia and China and Japan and, and on and on and very large worldwide insurance companies and et cetera, et cetera. Well, everybody in the world seems to know that if you've got a loan against the borrower's home, right, the odds are much higher that he'll pay it, okay, because he's scared that uh, if he doesn't, he's going to lose his home. But he's not so uh, uh, concerned if it's investment property. So if he loses his investment, well, what the hell, those are the breaks, you know. So the foreclosure factor on investment property is higher than the foreclosure factor on owner-occupied properties. How do they prove to these lenders that this pile of security, these tranches of loans, are owner-occupied? Well, they do sampling on a regular basis, and they'll, they'll pull out at random 5,000, 10,000 deals and, and check them with a computer and see what the name is. If the name is an, is an entity, all right, that's not a person. But if the names are person, individuals' names, then obviously that must be the owner of the property. Why did he go through all that trouble? Because then the uh, Fannie Mae does not, and that's the federal government, does not have to pay as much interest. Because since it's a safer loan, it's owner-occupied, they can get a sliver less of the loan. So if it's, let's say, you know, three and a half, uh, maybe they got, they're, they're only going to have to pay like three and, you know, uh, three-eighths or something like that. Well, an eighth of a point on jillions and jillions and jillions of loans amounts to a hell of a lot of money. So that's one of the underwriting requirements. It's not the bank. The bank gets to uh, sell its loan to Fannie Mae if they follow Fannie Mae's underwriting protocol. And that underwriting protocol requires that you only make a loan to an individual, okay? Now, if you want to borrow money, all right, and not have to take it out of the trust, there is a loan that many banks make. All the big ones do, and, uh, but, and that's not affected with this problem. The reason it's not is they're not going to sell it to Fannie Mae. It's what's called in the business a portfolio loan. Okay, and every um, home equity loan is a portfolio loan. Okay, and so now, why is that kept in a portfolio? Well, let's t let's turn you into a whole bunch of investors. You guys are investors, and you want a certain yield on your money, and you want to make sure that it's it's uh, it's dependable and it's going to come in each and every month and on and on, right? And so, do you go to Bank of Ward? <laughs> yeah, I go to Bank Award, and uh, so, um, and I say, you know something, I got a bunch of loans here that I, they'd be perfect for you, you know, and uh, these loans are, are uh, HELOCs, okay, or lines of credit. Now, well, let's say, let's say I had a HELOC for uh, a quarter of a million dollars, and you want to buy a note, and so, uh, how much would you offer the bank award for that loan? Would you offer 100000 for my quarter of a million dollar HELOC? How many say yes? Sure, some people are nodding their heads. What's the problem? Pardon? No, 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 that's nothing. Okay. No, the problem is that you cannot calculate how much yield you're going to make on that line of credit loan. 
because what's unique about line of credit is that you can pay the balance down to zero anytime you want, and now, and the loan still stays open, all right? But now that quarter of a million isn't out anymore. So Ward Hannigan, if he, so what I used to do is borrow the quarter of a million or more and go buy foreclosure, and when I flipped it and got paid back, I'd go right back to the bank and pay it off. But pay, basically what I do is pay the balance down Okay, so I've stopped the interest clock from ticking until I want to use it again. And that might be a year from now. So all of a sudden, you're thinking that you've, you've factored your yield on regular monthly payments, and with a HELOC, it doesn't work that way. So they can't sell those loans, all right? And so that's the kind of loan you want. When you want to go to the bank to borrow against property that you own, and you don't want that uh, to... Uh, uh, take it out of the trust's name, then tell them that you want a portfolio loan. That's the uh, slang, okay, that's used in the industry. You want a portfolio loan, okay, a HELOC. Does all that make sense to you now? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, 13. 13, thank you very much. I got a prompter here. <laughs> All right, a revocable trust affords a great deal of asset. asset protection, okay? Is that true or false? That's false, okay? Now look, guys, a, this trust does a fantastic job of giving you incredible privacy. But don't confuse that with asset protection. Why? Because it's revocable. And if it's revocable, you haven't given up on it. And so uh, a, a creditor can go to court and say, Your Honor, Mr. Hannigan says he doesn't own any property. However, he's got this, he deeded this property into a trust. And anytime he wants to borrow money, he takes it out of the trust and on and on. So, you know, he's just using that as a tool to flummox his creditors. So you'd have to have, in order to have some teeth in it, you'd have to have an irrevocable. Okay. All right. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, you'd have to transfer the beneficial interest in the trust out of your name. You can do that with an assignment of beneficial interest in trust, a non-recorded document. Okay. And the reason is because the beneficial interest in a trust is not recorded. Why? Because the only thing you can record at the recorder's office is what, guy? Uh, the, the deed itself. No, it has to be real property, doesn't it? If I sell my car, do I record that sale down at the recorder's office? No. If I buy stock, do I record that down at the recorder's office? No. no. Why? Because all that stuff is personal property. The only thing you record down at the recorder's office is what? Real property. real property, okay? So the beneficial interest, so that's kind of nifty because you can sell, go back and forth with the ownership of a trust and the public uh, doesn't have a clue who owns the trust, okay? Because you don't record the assignment of the beneficial interest in trust, okay? Um, so uh, why did I bring that up? I am. <laughs> 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 huh? Yeah. 13. 13. 13. 13. Oh, we're trying to, I'm trying to contrast why a revocable trust is, does not give you asset protection. And so number 14 says the opposite of a revocable trust would be an irrevocable trust. Okay. But now you got a house. And so you want it to be impervious to attack by a creditor. So you're going to have to then transfer the beneficial interest, all right, irrevocably, and transfer it to somebody else. Now, who's a logical person to, for you to give all of your ownership interest in a half a million dollar house to? You. No, your spouse. Somebody that you're related to, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, let's say this is a jury right now, and you heard Ward Hannigan transfer the property, all right, to 
my sons or something like that. And I didn't get anything for it. Would that look like a sham deal to you? No. Because I'm related to them. Can I give them something free without asking payment for? It? But if I gave it to Dallin, okay, uh, and he's not related to me, and I just say, wouldn't it sound ludicrous to you, the, the jury, if, oh, I gave this, uh, <laughs> the ownership of the trust to Dallin Gould, you know, for nothing, because he's such a nice guy? Nah, 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 nah. We're not going to believe that, <laughs> okay? So when you do it, it works if, and it solves a problem, because Dallin and I, you know, would have to, if we did that, we'd have to phony a sale, wouldn't we? If we phony the sale, how do we phony the payment? I'm going to give him a rubber check. I mean, he's going to give me a rubber check or something, right? That's not going to work. Strange. Yes. <laughs> and just turn and look at him. This guy would crumble in a court of law. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd have to start giving lessons in lying or something. So anyways, but it makes it perfectly good sense. Well, let's carry that through. So you deeded the property to your kids, all right? But you're still work. You're still living there. You're still paying a mortgage. You're paying for repairs. You're doing all this and that on property you don't even own, right? And so, would that be proof? Well, no. How do uh, the majority of people? How do they give their property to their favorite charity? Hmm? Donation. Yeah. And so if you want, let's say you're 40, you think you're going to live another 50 years or something because of medical advances. But right now you got the hots to give the zoo your house because, um, you know, if they sell it, it's worth a half a million bucks and they can buy two more orangutans or something, okay? So, you know, you got to... There's got to be a device, and hospitals use this. The Salvation Army uses this. The Red Cross uses it. Uh, any college you went to uses it, the gifting department, all right? And that's a, uh, a life estate. Somebody here know what a life estate is? What? Right, so you deed your property. You deed the legal title to the charity. All right, the university, whatever. But you retain what? A life estate. So they got legal title, but you kept, for a certain time period, the equitable title. What's the equitable title to something? The possession of it, mm -hmm. the use of it, okay, and on and on. Jim Goldstein just did it. Huh? Jim Goldstein just did it with the Lautner House to Mo the uh, LA County Museum. Who the hell's Jim Goldstein? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Did exactly that. He 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 put a life estate to his, a famous architectural property and gave it to Mocha. I mean, not Mocha. Okay, but so they can use it. There. Yeah, then he's reserved the right. Yeah. Okay, sure. So that's what you would do. So you would have a life estate. Now, can IRS or a creditor, you know, go ha ha ha? That's you don't want us to believe that. He said, well, wait a second, you know, call up the University of California, UCLA, and call the gifting department and ask them if they ever uh, are given property where the giver retains a life estate, you know. Yeah, it happens all the time. Call up Red Cross. Call up Salvation Army. Call up the zoo, okay. Call up any church. Just on and on and on. So you're not going to be thought of uh, by these or these lenders are not going to be able to, to sway a judge that that's a sham transaction as it happens so often. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Or if you, uh, if you remove a property from your local trust through an eminent domain, if you prove that you could pay them taxes and all that. Can you remove? So a, if you put it into an irrevocable trust. Yeah. And then five years later you decide you don't want it to be in there anymore, could you go through the Then that's not domain? irrevocable, right? <laughs> Sure, but you, whoever you gave it to, you'd have to con them into 
giving it back to you, right? Tell the kids they're not going to, you know, be able to go to the movies until you get your property back. <laughs> is a, Whatever. Is a life estate only a real property? No, you can have a life estate over cars. You can have a life estate over anything else that's valuable. You still want to be using it, right? The, that's what I was. Uh, he never called me up though. Asked me, um, who's the who's the famous uh, guy? He's a comedian. Jay Leno. No, this fellow's. Uh, he was in Sanford and Sons. He was the main a actor Red in Sanford. Fox. Red Fox. Fox. Red Fox had a passion like I did for old cars, right? And said him all all on his own property. Well, he didn't pay his income tax, so they came after him. And for some reason, no one told them that if he just took the title of his, pop, his cars, <laughs> all right, and put them into a trust. Now, in this instance, what kind of trust would it be? It'd be a personal property trust, because it's not real property. They put it in a personal property trust, right, and then transfer it, all right, the, the title, I mean, the beneficial interest in that trust to his adult son, mm -hmm. all right, coupled with a life estate. So. They would be parked at Red's house, and Red could put her around with him, and he could take him out whenever he wanted. But the federal government couldn't touch him, couldn't grab him, all right, because now they're his son's property, and the son is not responsible for the sins of the father, right? He should have taken my trust class. <laughs> all right. Is that it? 15. Oh, no, 15. 15. You would want to use an irrevocable trust format if your primary concern was asset, asset protection. Okay? So now you understand something that the bulk of the world doesn't, that what's critical is the revocability or irrevocability of whatever you've gifted away from yourself. Okay? And so if it's irrevocable, right, then what would happen? They come after and try to sue. Uh, you for the car or the house or whatever. And so then the person that is now the irrevocable owner would have to get an attorney, all right, and in order to stop, so they'd get a, an injunction against a creditor from trying to grab their property that was once owned by their father, but not anymore. And so why should I be, why should you be able to sue somebody because in the past he owned it, now you own it? Can you do a 1031 <laughs> exchange? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, all right, we're down to 16. If you were the beneficiary of a trust and had someone else acting as your trustee, your involvement in the trust would be unknown to the outside world. And I truly, truly, now why do I pick that adjective, outside world? See, I'm distinguishing that from what world? The inside world. What's the inside world? Those are people that know that you control that trust. Those are your tenants that you're renting to, the workmen that you're giving your check to to pay, and on and on. That's an inside threat. Outside threat, okay, is, you know, some uh, a creditor who's going to double check uh, the, uh, the uh, public record. He's going to go to DMV and see what vehicles you own. He's going to go down to recorders office and see what's real property you own. And so he's not going to find anything in your name. You don't have any cars in your name. It's in the cars are in the blue, the, the Black Beauty Trust. You don't have any property in your name, you know. If the property on Chestnut Street, it's a Chestnut Trust, and on and on and on. <coughs> All right. Yeah, that's true. Seventeen. The only way a trustee can be compelled to disclose the identity of a trust beneficiary is if a court ordered the trustee to do so. That's true. Huh? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, anyhow, um, that happens incredibly rarely. Okay. And the reason it does 
is because usually the trustee being sued, all right, to, to violate his oath of confidentiality is going to have an attorney provided for him, paid by the trust. That attorney is going to jump up and object that uh, he should he's being forced to break his oath of confidentiality for no good reason. Okay, you got to have a compelling reason to force him to do that. Um, 19, you can avoid all the hassles of probate. Now just remember that, probate, by taking title to real property in the name of a legal but fictitious entity, such as a trust or a partnership or a limited liability company or a corporation, etc. The reason a trust format is one of the most commonly used, is the one that's most commonly used, is because of its simplicity. How simple is creating a trust? I mean, how long, well, it, it, you could do it, okay? And so it's, it's quite simple. I don't think there's more than about five different blanks you have to fill in, right? You do all the work by going to the notary. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, all right, so because of its simplicity, all right, how simple is it to create corporations and LLCs and all that? It's not mm -hmm. all that simple, okay? No cost replication. Now why is that there, all right? Because if you want to get rich, all right, usually it's not by buying just one piece of property. No matter how much it, it appreciates, you're not going to be rich because of that one deal. So you got to do what in your lifetime? You got to accumulate a lot of them, okay? And so this is this replication. So you can replicate a trust incredibly easy because you don't have to go anywhere in the public to register it or get anybody's approval or record it, nothing, zero, okay? The next thing is uh, speed of creation, okay? How fast can you create a trust? Well, one of the thing, reasons I use it all the time down when I'm buying foreclosures is because the auction, if I was a winning bidder, he'd say, sold the ward Anakin, can I have your money please? Yeah. Then he comes back after uh, he's uh, finished with all the sales, and then he says, Ward, he says, okay, so how do you want to take title? Now, I didn't plan beforehand how would I take title because nine times out of 10, I didn't get the deal that day. It was either postponed or it was canceled or somebody else bid more than I did. So I'm not gonna bother preparing some paperwork just because nine times out of 10, you know, I'm not gonna get it. So I would go, Oh, let's see, um, let's call it, what street is it on? I'd ask the auctioneer just for fun. He'd say it's on Allegheny. Oh, okay, the Allegheny Trust. So it's Financial Fitness LLC, trustee of the Allegheny Trust, and you know, Ben, what's, what's today's date? <laughs> He'd say, you know, it's 2-18-16. Ah, 2-18-16. How much time did it take me? Not much. <laughs> Pretty fast, try that with uh, the corporation. All right. Where are we? What number? Well, that was 19. 19. But 19. We skipped 18. 19. 18. 18. You skipped 18 and you said nothing? Because well, we you want to go home early? <laughs> For that reason, we're going to have three more. <laughs> All right. If a beneficiary values the privacy of ownership, they should only authorize their trustee to prepare and issue a certification of trust to escrow, et cetera, in lieu of circulating a copy of their trust to establish the existence or terms of the trust. Also, they shouldn't record any document that would reveal their beneficiary status, okay? So certification of trust, very powerful. It allows you to continue to control uh, who knows uh, anything about that trust because it only goes, it's not recorded. Now, it's notarized by a trustee but it doesn't go into the public realm. All right, uh, so now we get back to speed of creation, unparalleled privacy. Now that might sound like an exaggeration, right? Let me tell you a little story. I always, when I came back from the auction, I would then uh, go to the template I had on my computer and I would then crank out a trust for that property. And, um, so I didn't have to get it notarized. All I had to do is put it in a file and sign it, put it in a file. Um, 
one day, I, and I have this practice, of, I have to free up some file space. So every once in a while, about six months after I've closed a deal, I then go to that file and I'll purge it of any uh, useless duplicates, this and that, and then take the uh, primary paperwork and I would stick it in a file and stick it in storage. So now I got my file space. One day I'm doing that and uh, so I'm looking in the file and I can't find the trust. Hmm. Uh, I must have missed, you know, in a drawer, I probably put it in this file instead of this one. And I go, oh, I gotta look through all those files and see which one I stupidly put it in. And I said, ah, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to the computer and just print out the one that I made, because you know, we don't erase it. Just, so I look in there for the name, uh, under the name of the trust, and um, I don't find the trust. I find the certification of trust, but I don't find the trust. And I go, wait a second. How can I buy property, put it in a trust name, and never need it? You know, and I go, holy smokes, that's fantastic. I don't even have to create this thing. It stay right up here. <laughs> okay? Now, in my case, I would need to have earplugs because it might dribble out. You know? <laughs> but no. It's cool. So, I mean, I think that's more privacy. Unpar that deserves unparalleled privacy. And no annual fees or taxes of any kind owed to the state franchise. Okay. 20. If you can arrange your exclusive use control and possession of property without any public indication that you have such power, you've gone a long ways. Property drops so fast that now it doesn't cover the balance of the loan. So he can't afford to pay it, so it goes in foreclosure. Nobody wants to buy it because they don't want to buy something that's got more loans than the value of the property. And so it goes to the lender uh, as the new owner, but there's a deficiency, right? The deficiency is, is the difference between what they ultimately got for the property and their balance. So they take this paper, this non-performing paper, and uh, they sell it to uh, what they call vulture funds. And these vulture funds buy this paper for literally <coughs> pennies on a dollar. And then they go to boiler rooms, all right, which are staffed by you know, college kids from local colleges making phone calls. And they just dial, dial, dial like crazy. Uh, or now use robo machines, so that they, basically what they're trying to do is get a, a some kind of money out of that, even though they know that they're never going to be able to fully collect it, but if they can get $345 now and show <laughs> a faith and all this kind of nonsense, do that over a lot of loans, and that's a profitable business. Well, they called up Lewis <coughs> and started um, really, um, you know, rattling his cage, and uh, so he was petrified that the guys were going to, they supposedly in Florida said, you know, we're getting a judgment against you here in Florida. Then through the principle of comedy, the common law, we're going to walk that judgment <coughs> over to California, get the uh, California's permission to record this in a public record where you've got your house, and then we'll be able to, it'll attach your house, and you won't be able to do anything with your house. We're going to grab it. Oh my God, you know, I'm going to take this house. So now Lewis is going physically nuts. He can't eat, he can't sleep, he's yada, yada, yada. All of a sudden, his brother is really concerned. So he says to Lewis, Listen, there's a guy that, if anybody knows how to solve this problem, it's Ward, my buddy Ward. So let's go see him. So he comes down, and he's really, he doesn't know me, and he's kind of wondering, you know. Am I going to want thousands of dollars from them or something? So I said, Lewis, all right, this problem is simple to solve. Because when they get a judgment for you, if they ever even bother doing it, I doubt if they'd even go do it in Florida. But if they do, they're going to have to go through a bunch of hoops that's going to cost them money. And they're not going to want to shell money out on a worthless debt. But let's say they do, and they come to California. Now they're going to record their judgment in the, uh, the, uh, in the county. When they do, that's going to automatically attach to any property that's in your name. So the solution to this is what? 
Get it out of your name. Put it in a trust. Okay? So bingo. So he lived on Athens Avenue. So it was Financial Fitness, LLC, trustee of the Athen, An Athen Trust, right? Dated such and such. Bingo. It's now been Teflon coated, that title. And nothing's going to stick to it. And uh, so it doesn't matter now if they if they carry out their threats, which I doubt they would, but if they carried it out, you're still not going to lose your house. So that's an example of what I was talking about on uh, 20. If you can arrange your exclusive use, control, and possession of property without any public indication, you have such power. You've gone a long ways towards protecting property from being subject to seizure or held hostage until some account is paid or cleared. Okay. 21, in an over litigious society, one should take care to avoid the appearance of wealth. That's what I specialize in. <laughs> so as to not attract the avaricious attention of con artists and scamsters. 22, the passing of title to real property from one party to another is accomplished by recording the transfer deed in the public record. If you don't want the public to be aware of the new owner's position, and just add an intermediate step. Show a transfer of the property's title to the current owner's trust or partnership or corporation, and then sell all the shares of stock or all the beneficial interest of the trust to a new owner. Since shares of stock or trust interest is personal property, not real property, the sale of such assets are not recorded in the public record. Now, there's a new code section out that makes this, um, that comes at this angle. Basically, the, um, what is it? Uh, Todd Frank? No, no, no. The mortgage law? No, it's like uh, OEM or something. Oh, um, Department of Business Oversight? Well, anyways, I'll think of that name too. Um, a regulation came out that basically said that um, if you are buying the controlling, here's that word again. Yes, B -O -E. Huh? The important, the important there you go. Thank what? you very much. January 2000. <laughs> 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 so it's the Board of Equalization. So the Board of Equalization came out with a regulation that basically says that if you buy, and they put this, the onus of this on a buyer's back, if you buy, a controlling interest in an entity that owns real property. You must notify the board within 45 days of the occurrence of that or pay a, uh, a penalty. I think it's a 10% penalty, something like that. Okay. So now why did they make that kind of regulation that the <laughs> buyer has to think, uh, you know, uh, snitch on himself to the Board of Equalization. Why do they need him doing it? Nobody else knows. Exactly. <laughs> so, wow. you can volunteer to snitch on yourself if you want to. <coughs> okay. <laughs> um, but if you haven't created a trust, there is no Ben. Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> so, I hope you're getting the idea how versatile this little gizmo is, you know. It's like the Swiss Army knife of real estate. Um, where are we at now? 23. Transferring the title of real property that's secured by a deed of trust which contains a due on sale clause is illegal. That's false. That's false, okay. The Garn St. Germain Act of 1982 legitimized the due on sale clause but it also puts some restrictions on it, and it says lenders cannot call their loans due, all right, in certain circumstances. And one is like a divorce, and there's a name change, or there's a death in the family, and there's a name change, and yada, yada, yada. There are nine exceptions. Exception number eight is if the owner of the real property transfers his title out of his name to his, um, the inter vivos trust, which means like living trust, then that's um, 
uh, safe from being the due on sale clause coming up. Well, that's what we run a Mack truck right through that, okay? And so to make sure that, it, that it, uh, lenders never pick up on it, all right, when I buy property from somebody and I take it a subject to, I'm going to ask, I usually do this, I go, you know, uh, Mr. Jones, uh, do you mind uh, how I take title to the property? He says, no, I don't care. I say, do you mind if I put it in my trust? No, knock your socks off. Okay. And I say, you know, this would be work really great if I named my trust the Jones Trust, because that way, if a lender ever, ever accidentally saw the deed, all right, they would think that this was the exception number eight because it's going from Mr. Jones to financial fitness trustee of the Jones Trust. That works fantastic. Okay. Um, now, I've, I'm, I've got something I really want to talk about. All this other stuff is just fluff, okay? <laughs> so what I really want to talk about is something that you may not have heard. It's one of the safest investments you can ever do. It takes no <coughs> management effort at all. Your money's guaranteed by the federal government. So do you want to go home or do you want to talk about that? Talk about it. Tell you about it? Okay. So. I discovered this thing in 1985, and uh, some of you know about it. Some of you have taken my class in it already. And what's it called, Dallin? Uh, Dingbat. No. Dingbat. Oh, Dingbat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He says that so nonchalantly. Oh yeah, Dingbat. Okay. <laughs> and a Dingbat. That's what I had to call it because um, remember all in the family with Archie Bunker. Yeah. Okay. What did he call his wife? Yeah. Ding bad, right? Which means something crazy, silly, you know, not understandable, whatever. So ding bad to me is a one bedroom, standalone, single family home, not a part of any other building, doesn't have a common wall with anything else. Nothing above it, beside it, below it. It's just a dinky little one bedroom house, okay? And I rent it to a very special, so that's a special piece of real estate, isn't it? A dinky, tiny little house. How many people here are drooling over having one of those? <laughs> huh? <laughs> you are, because you, you know how powerful it is. But, I mean, nobody wants it. I love buying something that nobody else wants to buy. Okay? And I love to buy from somebody who's embarrassed, you know, that is 90 years old, and it's a one-bedroom house, doesn't have a garage, and it's on the wrong side of the tracks or something. Okay. So the other part that makes this work is the tenant, the very special tenant. That tenant is someone who hates moving. Well, who hates moving, you know? Every single person in this room, when you get to be about 65, you're going to think, God damn it, I've lived long enough, 65, you know, and I deserve some peace and quiet. Now, I just want a show of hands. How many people here sincerely think right now that they're in that group, that they deserve some peace and quiet? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> look at these hands going. And so they want this little dinky house and they hate what I hate. As a landlord, I hate turnover. I hate, all right, tenants leave. Why? Because now I got a vacancy. I did, now I don't get rent for that time period. I now got to go get some overpriced a handyman to, to fix all the stuff that went on. And then I got to advertise it and sit there and suck my thumb for another month or so. All the time, I'm losing rent. Okay? Yeah. Well, if you rent to some, a retiree, a retired um, senior citizen, all right, who is, <clears throat> and he has to be a recipient of a rental subsidy from Section 8. 
and that's where your guaranteed income comes in. Okay. Now he's not paying it to you. You get 80 to 90 percent of it directly from Section 8. You get the other 10 or 20 percent from the the um, yeah tenant. Now, how can you be so confident that they're going to pay their portion, even though it's kind of small, all the time without any problem? Exactly right. They will lose their Section 8 voucher. In other words, I don't have tenants this stupid, okay, who will not pay my 10% to me, and as a consequence then get kicked out of Section 8, and I'll have to pay 100% of their rent, all right, to somebody else. And, then, and they have to wait at the back of the line to get on Section 8 again. On San Diego, that's 11 years, okay? So I don't ever have, never had a Section 8 tenant even be late with their little sliver to me. Yes, sir? Can you um, choose who wants to tenant? Well, can't you now? No, I'm asking. No. I'm huh? Asking. I'm asking. I know you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, if you have three or four people to choose from on Section 8, can you say no because she has three kids and I don't want to rent to her? I, I want the older. Well, yeah, because three kids, the Section 8 is going to allow, not going to allow that in a one bedroom house. Okay? So, no. And then, so you might say, well, what if I get a 22 year old single gal or guy? Okay? They don't have kids in this and that. Well, there's this old saying, birds of feather flock together, right? So where are you going to advertise this? You going to put a for rent sign out in your, in the, uh, in your front yard? No. no, no. So you're going to advertise this where senior citizens congregate. Now where do they congregate? Senior rec centers. Now what I love, is the senior nutritional centers. Most of you probably don't even know anything about them. <laughs> so I go, they got as many senior nutrition centers as they have branch libraries in the average uh, metropolitan area. San Diego, there's probably 20 to 22 of them, okay? So just about every neighborhood. Now, the federal government, our federal government practices price supports, right? We have price supports for cotton, wheat, corn, grains, milk, butter, eggs, yada, yada, yada. And we do that supposedly in order to keep the farmers alive and things. So what do we do with all that stuff? We give it away. So we use tons. You've ever wondered why there's any kind of disaster anywhere in the world that the United States is so eager to fill these giant jumbo planes with all this free stuff and fly it over there and give it away for free? It's going to rot anyways. Now the world loves us, okay? This is, and I think it's fantastic we do it, but they also do the same thing. They give away a lot of this stuff on the domestic scene. So if you've got a uh, nutrition center and you've got volunteers that are, are preparing the food and this and that, you got somebody else that volunteered the place, you know, and uh, you got uh, this free food that the federal government provides. They can make very nutritious, low-cost meals for uh, needy people. And actually, you don't have to be that needy. If you're uh, 62 or 65, I can't remember what it is, uh, then that, that uh, meal, that, that lunch is... Um, about three dollars and fifty cents. If you're younger than that, then you pay about double. It's about six bucks or seven bucks. Okay, but it's actually a fairly large lunch. They tell you to bring your Tupperware, you know, and take the surplus home because they only feed you five days a week. So they want you to save up some of it for Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> okay. So what I do is I make a flyer for my vacancy. And I got a cute little picture, and, uh, and I describe the house. Make sure that you have laundry hookups. Old people don't want to put their dirty clothes 
in a pillowcase and trudge down the street and then go to a laundromat and then sit there and guard their undies, you know, for, you know, three hours. You know, they're missing a whole bunch of TV doing that. <laughs> so, so anyways, so you, you have to have the hookup, okay, the laundry hookups. But um, I have 15 of these suckers. And I'm now branching out because I can't find good deals in San Diego. Who's from Kern County in here? Are oh, you? Kevin, Kevin, he's sitting outside eating. <laughs> oh, tell him, do not leave until I get his name and number. Okay. okay. So I branched out because I cannot find dingbats um, within the, uh, the price constraints I have. All right? <laughs> Section 8, it's amazing. Section 8 only pays based on how many bedrooms that unit has. It cares nothing about the size of the bedroom. It cares nothing about the age of the house, the location of the house, any other variable. It could care less. It's inflexible. It only gives, in their area, X number of bucks. It's called a payment standard. So the payment standard in Kern County, as an example, uh, for a one-bedroom house, and not even just a house, it could be a one-bedroom house, a one-bedroom condo, mm -hmm. a one-bedroom apartment. Uh, it could be half of a duplex or a triplex or blah, blah, blah. But it's just got to be a one-bedroom, okay? And so the payment standard for that is $699 a month. I call it $700, extra buck, okay? So $700. And I figured out this formula. You guys write it down. Then you won't need me. You take, you have to find out from local section eight what the payment standard is, all right? When you call section eight, you want someone who's been specifically hired, all right, to be very friendly with landlords, okay? And they call that the landlord liaison. There's so many landlords in the years past are so pissed at section eight that they dropped out of the program. Ah, now they cater to landlords and they got a special employee and uh, so when the landlord, when you call up, you call up Section 8 in your area, and you ask for the landlord liaison. You're not gonna get any run around, no mysterious hang-ups, all that nonsense, okay? And so they get online and you say, listen, I got, uh, I'd like to know uh, what the payment standard, you gotta use that terminology, what's the payment standard for one bedroom in uh, Section 8 in Kern County, let's say? And she'll tell you. You say, listen, do you have a landlord package? All right, because I'm thinking of, of uh, getting some property in Kern County and uh, renting it out. Man, they'll send you a five uh, a $5 package of uh, a landlord, uh, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, familiarization or whatever you want to call it, package. Um, and it has a lot more stuff in it. Um, so. I'm going to, I, when I go to the nutrition center, I get there, they open up usually 11 o'clock, or whatever time they, they start, be there on Lombardi time. Lombardi time is? Early. Early. 15 minutes early, right? Vince Lombardi, famous coach. If his players didn't show up for appointments 15 minutes early, he find them 100 bucks. Anyways, uh, so I go there about 15 minutes early. It puts me at the head of the line where I want to be because I'm going to hand out these 20 or 30 flyers, but I can't be really obvious about it, right? So I'm in line, and so when someone else, you know, comes up behind me, all right, um, like Peter, let's say, he was behind me, I turn around and say, hi, I'm Ward. Hi, Ward. And you're? Jeannie. Hi, Jeannie. You know, you look a little bit too prosperous to be in <laughs> Section 8 program, but I've got some flyers here. I'd like to give you one, not because you may need it, may not need it, but because I'm sure you have friends and relationships mm -hmm. that um, do need it. Mm -hmm. And you're probably aware that if a, they're displaced because someone bought their little tiny house and now they're putting a McMansion up or something like that, he's got 90 days to find another place to roost mm -hmm. or he loses his voucher. So why don't you keep this, got my name and number on it. I got about a dozen in this area. And if you can help out a friend of yours, you know, that'd make you happy, wouldn't it? Sure. sure. So, okay. Well, Jeannie, why don't you get ahead of me 
and I go to the next one. I go to, so, <laughs> I'm, I'm like an inchworm, you know, I go down like this, and nobody knows about it, and I, I, I hand out, and on my deal, my little flyer, I've got down at the bottom, if you need a ride, all right, just give us a call, we'll come pick you up to show you the unit, and we'll take you back home, because a lot of people who are very low income cannot afford a car, and so it's kind of hard for them to come on over. So I'd much rather to go pick them up and bring them back. Okay. So section eight, um, so I'm, I'm getting a cash flow. Um, yeah, I, I admit that it's not the bulk of my monthly income, but I like it more than just about anything else. I have a self-storage facility where I get a lot more than that monthly coming into me, but I, I never brag about that, but I'm always talking about my damn dingbats. Yeah, so you take the 700. I didn't finish that up. I'm going to give you this formula. So you take 700 and you multiply it times 90. So what's 9 times 7? So that you can't pay any more than $63,000 for that property after it's fixed up and still make a net 10% yield on your money. You want an ROI? ROI is what? Return on investment. These are investments. So if you got 10% on your money today, would that be pretty damn good? And don't be surprised, I buy these things for a lot less than that, so my yields are 15, 18%, stuff like that. Yes, sir? You're buying in the city of county for less? No, no. But why do I care? I've got one in Phoenix. I never see it. I never see the dinkbat that's three and a half miles from me at my office, and I never see the one that's 350 miles. All right, how far is, is, uh, is Bakersfield from me in San Diego? I forget, it takes me three and a half miles to get, three and a half hours to get there, and three and a half back. There's one mistake I made, I added that to my rule, all right? Don't buy a dingbat in a place you can't fly to. <laughs> okay. I don't like driving. You know, not like that. I mean, I can't drive it, I can I? Right. By the way, your food is ready, Lord. Just just incentivizing you to that your food is ready I for you to come. Right. That that'd be okay. What? So if you are using your formula and if you buy a That's not the formula yet. So let me finish it, oh. and then you can butt in ski. I mean, you can. <laughs> so. But you said to call you. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, I know, but you're the very next person I would talk to. All right, so that's 63,000. That presumes that it's ready to go, ready to rent. We know that that's not logical thinking with these old houses that are 90 years old and on and on. You're going to have to have some deferred maintenance. My rule of thumb, as I found out, is I'm paying about 10% to fix this house up. So 10% of what? Of that 63,000. So I'll round it down a little bit. I'll spend about six grand. All right. So now I got to lower that 63, right? By 6,000, I'm down to what? 57,000. 57, okay. Now, if I want to get it at 57, I can't start out offering that, can I? So I got to offer even a little bit more. By the way, I'll share with you a fantastic, see all the good stuff you're getting because you didn't take off? All right. <laughs> I make offers, all right? And it's incredibly effective. I never make an offer in a rounded off number. Peter, give me an example of a rounded off number. 50,000 bucks. 50,000 bucks. It sounds like you plucked it out of your butt, okay? I mean, where did that come from, you know? So what I do is I make an offer, right, a 49.3, okay? And so I'm like, what is that telegraph? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's like, wow, well, you must have calculated that. So it doesn't seem to be like a, a phony baloney. And uh, so I do that with, um, also with um, counter offers, okay? Now, most stores do it, don't they? Yeah. Eight ninety nine, you yeah. know? Yeah. Must work. You keep doing it all the time. All right, so I make an offer. Now, I buy all cash. All cash is really a, a, a sledgehammer, all right, to, to buy stuff. And uh, 
because I can close with all cash, I can close almost immediately. Well, how long do you think they've been sitting there with their one bedroom on the MLS? Because nobody wants the damn thing except Ward Hannigan, you know? And so it's like nine months, 10 months, something like that. So I come along and I make them an offer, you know? And, uh, and I'll buy it, sight unseen. Sounds crazy, okay? And um, so, uh, anyways, now I've got to, I, I, I get, I open up escrow, and I now have uh, uh, put money in it, but I'll put money in the damn thing. I order a, I call up, I ask my, the agent up there, my contact, say, hey, what escrow company are you gonna use? Well, we're gonna use, uh, you know, XYZ escrow, fan. So I call up XYZ escrow, and I say, you know something, I'm, we're, I'm involved in a transaction, we're gonna do the escrow with you folks, and I understand that you are really quite a crackerjack outfit. Um, <laughs> and so I am, uh, I need an inspector, okay, a house inspector, but I need the inspector from hell, okay? I need the inspector that finds so much crap wrong that no seller will ever use it, okay? He's, I want the guy who has a passion of finding everything wrong with the property just because he gets off on that, okay? So, and so they give me a name. So now I call that inspector up. I say, hi, I'm buying a house here in Bakersfield and you come highly recommended as one of the most thorough inspectors, <laughs> all right? You spend easy two hours inspecting and your average report, I understand, is about 30 or 32 pages long. Did I, did I get that right? And he says, well, yes, sir, I certainly did, you know? <laughs> I said, so how much does your inspection cost? Ah, 350, I said, fine. How do you like to get paid? I'll pay you right now, you know? And so PayPal, okay, whatever it is, credit card here, I'll pay you. Now, send me that report when you're done uh, and then send a copy to my agent so she can give a, a copy of it to the seller. Sure, okay. So now I take that 30 page report, all right? I roll it up and I beat the shit out of that seller with it. It's like, hey, you got, you have, you, you know that this report, I mean, this is amazing that you've let things go this far, you know. The estimate from the inspector and I'm not holding his feet to it, but he estimates, and I actually get him to do this with me, he estimates gonna cost about $11,200, there's that odd number, okay? $11,200 to, to bring this property back up to a, a habitable uh, premises. Now, those are the problems that are accumulating for years and years under your ownership. So I don't have, I'm not responsible for that. But I'll tell you what I'll do, just to be fair, okay? I'll eat half of that number, and you take care of the other half. Is that fair? I, by the way, it's one of my favorite words, fair. Use it a lot. It's magic, okay? And I also like the word again, okay? How do I use again? I go, well, when I worked, when I worked for IBM, I was out, and I was their star salesman in Hemet, California, Paris, my God, and all this and that. And uh, so, but uh, you couldn't get into the decision maker in most companies. You had secretaries and on and on that would keep you away from the decision maker. That was their job, okay? So I'd call up on the phone and I'd say, hi, is uh, uh, John in, or whatever the doctor's first name is, Tell him Ward, this is Ward Hannigan again. Oh, like my last name was again. <laughs> this is Ward Hannigan again. And so she thinks that I've got an ongoing conversation with her. And she puts me right through. I mean, I think I'm gonna call up Obama and say, this is Ward Hannigan again. <laughs> Probably get right through. So use that word again. Use fair, all that kind of stuff. All right. Um, 
So, um, you got any questions on that? Okay. Is this a, is this an okay place to pause for a minute? Because I need to un unmic you for a minute. I just. <laughs> Unmike me. Yes, I Pretty soon little. you're going to take off my shirt. The next time. <laughs> <laughs> we promised that earlier. Shoes. You said we couldn't, remember? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so I got to go over there? We got to unmike you, yep. Okay, so ask your guys, guys ask questions if you want. We just got to unmike okay, him. Can I ask a question now? Yes, yes. The, um, you said to call up the landlord liaison. And so any property that you buy, you can make it into a Section 8 housing? Yes, you okay. can. But what you do is, if you'll call up the uh, uh, landlord liaison uh -huh. and ask her to send you that landlord package, uh -huh. it has a whole schedule. It goes up to like five bedrooms. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. That's our recorder. Okay. You babysit it. Explain what? The formula. <laughs> oh, I'm going to explain the formula again for somebody. So you've got to buy. The reason I came up with this I like your is because I have agents who are looking for property for me in about three counties. I'm going to increase that to about the easy a half dozen counties all at the same time so that I feel that they're covering three county areas, okay, or six county areas is what I really want to do, that I'm bound to have one of them pop up one a month. So now I can get my buying tempo up here to where I'm buying one or two a month. Wow. Yeah. I'm concerned about that time because you see, I don't have too much left. <laughs> I can't wait around all this. I got to get rich before I die.